Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Chuck Mason, and with me today is the president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society and our sponsor, Janelle Blue. And today we're going to talk about something in a little more detail. We have touched on it at various times, and that's something called the genealogical proof standard, which is a process for working through and evaluating documents and records. And it was brought out at, I think, the 1997 National Genealogical Society's conference down in Richmond, Virginia. And it's a five-step process. So step one is we conduct a reasonably exhaustive search for all the information that is or may be pertinent to the identity relationships, events, or situations in question. So we start out with a question, and it's not who are all my ancestors or everything about my great-grandfather or grandmother. We pick something specific, and we start out by asking that question, and then we conduct a reasonably exhaustive search. And that is the age-old question of, for all genealogists. What does that include? Yes, it's something that people get hung up on. And so, you know, a reasonably exhaustive search means you look at all the records you may be able to find to help answer the question. But we also realize that there are restrictions on records. We have 72-year restriction on census. We have restrictions on vital records and things like that. We also deal with missing or lost records. I always like to use the example, years ago I went out to the Fairfax County Court Archives and found that they have a couple of missing deed books and will books. Mm. And the project I was working on needed one of those. So those things. Also, sometimes it may be too costly, as I'm going to talk about what I used the process to resolve. There was a cost involved in getting vital records that, because of the questions that were asked about where people were born, and the answers to be given were only the state or the country if they were foreign born, that was not going to help me, so I didn't spend $25 a vital record looking mm. for birth and mm. death records. And you know, there are other reasons why their records may be unavailable you know, in addition to those. So we look at all the things that, as a competent genealogist, we should look at in the process. Yeah. And we also, as a part of that, want two independent sources, not something that is a derivative of another source. And we're also always looking for primary or original records. But we realize we have to use those derivative and secondary sources. But, but sort of how much is enough is really based on the quality of those records, mm -hmm. isn't it? And, and the reliability mm -hmm. of, of, of the different documents that you have. Yes, definitely. Then the second step is we include uh, a complete and accurate source citation so that if someone wants to go back and evaluate our sources, they can do that. I do this a lot with the NGS home study course that I grade, I will look at students' evaluations and I'll think, I don't think so. So I get on the internet or, or if they've included the record, I look at it. And then we analyze and collate the collected information and assess it for the quality as evidence. And then we resolve any conflicts that are caused in the uh, evidence or by the evidence that contradicts or is contrary to our proposed or our hypothetical solution to the question. Because we usually start out with the question and then we figure, okay, how do we solve it? What we have a proposal of how we're going to solve it. And then one of the really important things that I think people tend to let go is write it up. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Why did you draw that conclusion? Right. I, I have a, an example, not one I'm going to use today, but I have an example that I use in some of my lectures where I killed off my second great grandparents. <laughs> but at the time, and now this was work that I was done long before we had anything on the internet and was easy to access. So I was only looking at records in research facilities and archives and things. And so based on what I had, I killed them off between 1870 and 1875. And then I found down the road, I looked for other information and I found records that led me in a different direction and mm -hmm. I found the actual answer. So, so my problem that I decided uh, about six, no, more than that, probably about 10 years ago was to resolve where my father's mother was born. My father's mother, number one, lied about everything. <laughs> and I could give you that examples. We, we could do a two hour show <laughs> on, on those things. But, you know, where she was born, because we had things that were passed down and we also had documents and I gathered more documents that she was either born in New Jersey, most likely in Hoboken or Jersey City, or she was born in New York City where she said at, for many years she was actually born. And her parents were Gottlieb, Lehman and Mary Carroll and they are two of my brick walls. So, Traditionally, we always celebrated her birthday on June the 5th, and as far as I knew, she was born in 1897. So one of the places that I often go when I am looking for when do I look for a person's birth record, if they were living in 1900, I look at the 1900 population schedule because it says the month and the year the person was born. Right. And so that 1900 schedule did tell me that she was born in March of 1895. So I did a search in the New Jersey State Archives because the birth records were microfilmed and I could look for them. And I looked at birth dates and neither one of them were correct. Uh, now, one of the things that, that I found with all New Jersey vital records, as I mentioned, they only ask where the person was born, either the state if they were born in the United States, or the country if they were foreign born for births, deaths, and marriages. So I found no birth records for either date for her, so then I decided, okay, let's eliminate the easiest place, which was New York, because she said that she was born in New York on uh, 1920, 30, and 40 censuses, when she was most likely giving the information. I know in 1940 she definitely did. So I uh, had a delayed birth certificate for my father that said she was born in Fort Hamilton, New York. Mm -hmm. Very specific, and this yeah. was in 1945. So I'm, that's the one thing I'm anxious to see where she said on the 1950 census where she was born. But I could not think of why she would have been born in Fort Hamilton because that's a military base in New York. Ah. So I, I wrote actually to, to uh, New York City and I had them do a check for both March of 1895 and June of 1897 and the answer came back and said, no, we have no birth record for her. Huh. So, you know, one of the things with the census records, and I think you have a question about, about this, but one of the things that, that uh, with the census records, we don't know for sure who actually answered the questions other than on 1940. Right, exactly. So you don't know if, 
if it was a neighbor or it was uh, an in-law in or, or just somebody the kids visiting. Or, or, yeah. And I was able to basically pretty much eliminate anybody but my grandmother answering the questions because the census taker would have come around during the day. My grandfather worked on a dairy farm. He was an employee, so he would have been at work. Uh, my, my uncles would have been too young to answer in 1920, would have been in school in 1930, and my father would have been too young. He would have been under two years old. So I don't think, and I don't think the way that the, the housing was laid out on the farm. My grandparents' house was out on the main road. Down about a quarter of a mile was a lane back to the manager's office where all the other employees' houses were. Uh -huh. I know the census taker came down the road, did all of those, and then hit their house for 1920. He did the reverse in 1930. But bands, I already have the wrong answer in 1920. I figured my grandmother answered in 1930. So uh, in terms of the birth record, so were, was New Jersey doing birth records at yes. that time? They have the second oldest continual vital records after Massachusetts. Okay. They begin May 1st, 1848, and there's wow. no break in them. Now, not everybody got registered as they were supposed to, but they uh -huh. have the longest running after Massachusetts. So then it's back to the New Jersey birthplace, and I looked at 1900 and 1910 population schedules when my grandmother's parents most likely answered the questions, and they say, New Jersey. I also had a baptismal certificate for her. Actually, I had two. One issued in 1910 and one issued in 1962. Now, the 1910 one did not have a birthplace on it. The 1961 had a birthplace on it, but the form had a place. And I think because the Catholic Church was in Hoboken, the priest who copied the information added Hoboken. Oh, dear. Because I was able to get the microfilm of the church registers, and I found there was nothing, nothing. on birthplace. The birth date was confirmed but the birthplace was not confirmed in the church register. So, you know, that led me to believe that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on the right track here. Now, the, the register, the birth register, or that register in the church, was that a later register? Or that no, it was done, like done a membership? as, it was the baptismal mm -hmm. register done as, children were baptized. So as her children were baptized? Uh, well, as my grandmother, my grandmother was baptized a day short of being 14 months old, which is not the norm for the Catholic Church. Right. Her older two siblings, who were three and some months and seven and some months old, were also baptized on that day. Okay, so they had some And they were children that and... later, <laughs> later died young. So then I went to my grandparents' marriage record, and the marriage record from Elkton, Maryland, did not give where they were, lo where they were born. The location space was there. It was blank. But it said that they were currently residing in Vineland and Jersey City. And I knew that was a lie from my grandfather, who I could trust. And then she did apply in 1972 for a social security number, and there she finally says she was born in Hoboken. And then her death certificate, again, my grandfather was the informant, and it only said that she was born in New Jersey. So then I had to establish all of her siblings, because I felt this would give uh, me backup. Sure. So I established the siblings, and I found those two uh, George, who died when he was just a little past three, and it, uh, it did not give a birthplace other than the USA for him. And Rosie also on her death certificate only said USA. So I had the 
went to the question on the censuses in 1900 and 1910, how many children did the mother give birth to and how many were still living? That matched for 1900 that she had given birth to eight children and there were six living, my grandmother and five siblings, and that I had verified. In 1910, she said she had, been, had given birth to nine children and six were living. I still can't find that child. I can't find a birth record. I can't find a death record like I could for the other two. Uh -huh. So then I started through the siblings, and I just started through all of her brothers and one sister. She had four brothers and one sister. So I looked at records for them. I looked for birth certificates for all the children. And when I say I looked for birth certificates, I could go in and physically look at the microfilm of the birth records okay. for New Jersey. So okay. I did that. None of the children's births were registered. Looking at all the information that I had on each of them, playing with all the census records, the, the ages, and subtracting it from the year and getting the various Goodness. years of birth. Nothing in, in there gave me. And of course, uh, the 1900 gave me the month and the year to start off with. So for her, her brother, Andrew, uh, I found that he was married in 1908. In, and it said on there, he was born in Hoboken. He also was required to register for the World War I draft, and that said he was born in Hoboken. And how, what's the age difference between him and... Uh, I forget. Was I, it close? Uh, well, they were all basically born between 1888 and 1900. So, so I guess if there's a way to figure out where they lived. I mean, yeah. that would... Yeah. So <laughs> then I looked at her brother, Frank, and again, nothing in this, in the, uh, the birth records, but his marriage record said that he was born in West Hoboken, and he was actually the youngest child. How, and, and what's the difference between Hoboken and West Hoboken? Right across the railroad <laughs> tracks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Jersey City is right next door. Okay. You know, so they're not far apart. Um, and his draft registration card um, did not include a place of birth. And then her brother Harry, again, no birth registration, but his marriage record also said he was born in. West Hoboken, and he was the next of the youngest, so born after my grandmother. Frank and, and Harry were born after my grandmother. Marriage record said he was born, was born in West Hoboken, and so did his draft registration. She had an older sister, and she got married, and her marriage record said she was born in Hoboken. And also, she died in 1943, and her son was the informant, and he said she was born in Hoboken. And then her youngest brother, Walter, or uh, not youngest brother, last brother, I believe he was number two in the line, said on his marriage record he was born in Hoboken. And his draft registration said he was born in Hoboken. So I put all of this together. I put, you know, the fact that she said she was born in New York on censuses and my father's delayed birth certificate. And I discounted that because number one, there was no record to back it up. Even though on the birth record, she gave a sworn statement swearing to the accuracy of the information that she gave. Knowing my grandmother, <laughs> I discounted that as one of her little fairy tales that, <laughs> that she told along the way. And the fact that I could not find any record of her being born. I also discounted the 1895 birth date in the 1900 census because 
One of her brothers was born in 1895, and there was no way that her mother could have gotten pregnant again. They weren't because, twins? No. He was born in February or, February or January, and she supposedly was born in March. Ah. But of course, him on the census said he was born in 1894, but the records I found for him said 1895. So I discounted New York totally. And then I looked at the summary of things. And Yes, she could have been born someplace else, but when you put together kind of a timeline of all of the records and the places, she most likely was born in Hoboken because all of the others, but those youngest two, were born in Hoboken. Hoboken yeah. And West Hoboken, it, it literally is kind of a railroad track when you look at maps of, of the time frame. Yeah. There's railroad tracks, and one side of the map is Hoboken, and the other side is West Hoboken. And of course, in some cases, I also had street addresses, or at least street names that I could look at, and put all of this together and decide that finally, I believe that she was born in Hoboken. So what you've done is to try to solve this question through indirect evidence. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, I tried both. Right. And, and, but, you know, the direct evidence or the, or the records, original records, is, did not give me, either gave me false information or did not give me an answer. Right. And, you know, so then I added the siblings in because that, Boosts, you know, if all of the children are born there. It's, yeah. it's not like a friend of mine came to me with a problem years ago. She had a family that started out here in Virginia and went to Tennessee or Kentucky and, and on to Arkansas and ended up in Nebraska. And there were actually three brothers and their families that traveled this route. But her direct ancestor, Children kind of in the middle of the group of children said they were born in Indiana and consistently every census record, every other record that she could find said they were born in Indiana. And so what she said to me was, what do you think? And I said, I think you need to go look at Indiana because I think you're going to, you've got something there. If it was one census, yeah, somebody didn't know the answer. But consistently, from the time the parents gave the information through all of the adult years, consistently said they were born in Indiana. So I said, you need to go look. And she did, and she found out. Land was cheaper in Indiana. The one brother took off, bought land, was you know, growing crops, had a farm growing crops, and then they had a drought one summer. Uh. And they lost the crops, so they had no money, and they lost the farm because they couldn't pay the taxes and the mortgage on the farm, and they went back to Nebraska. So that was fairly simple to, to solve, but that was a variation. Yeah. But my grandmother was the only one of these, these six children that said she was born in New York. Well, what, so hypothetically, uh, what, perhaps her mother was visiting a relative in New York? But I can't find it. That was one of the other things <laughs> that I did. I'd, I could not find any connection to New York. Okay. Now, granted, I'm having a hard time with her parents. There could have been the reason that she, her mother might have been in New York, but I can't find that they had any family in New York. And they can't find they have any family in New Jersey either. But were, and, and you weren't sure whether they were really in the Catholic Church at the time your grandmother was born, right? I mean, because well, they were confirmed, uh, she was baptized yeah, much later. Traditionally, well, number one, my great grandparents were married in an Episcopal church. Mm. They're married in the rectory of an Episcopal church. So, and he was German. So I, I don't believe he was Catholic, but I believe he did what my grandfather said to my grandmother. I don't care what you raise the kids. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. My grandmother ended up raising my father and his siblings as Methodists. But, you know, 
obviously her mother raised her as Catholic and her siblings. And my grandmother was actually you know, Catholic until my father's oldest brother was born. And that's another story that <laughs> I have to tell you some, some time. But. Well, I was just thinking about, you know, perhaps it wouldn't be in the Catholic Church that the records would be in a different denomination or maybe, because, I mean, maybe they were registered in the church, but they weren't never registered through the civil yeah. registration. The, see, the, the doctor or the midwife was supposed to do the registrations. The parents were also supposed to make sure that that got mm -hmm. done. But well. I have one case of one family where they had four children. They had a boy, a girl, a boy, a girl. When I went looking for the records, the two boys were registered, the two girls were not. Because I literally went down the, through the birth certificates looking for them. <laughs> that on the shows microphone. you how happy they were about having girls. You know. Well, it, it was, you know, this is the 1870s, and so, mm. you know, they may have decided, well, it's no big deal for the girls' births to be registered. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you find a lot of, a little later, but you find a lot of um, birth certificates being, being corrected. Mm-hmm because of things like that. Yeah, so, yeah. so basically, we have talked about the problem. Did you want to mention Mount Vernon Genealogical Absolutely. Society? Absolutely, yes. People? Mount Vernon Genealogical Society is um, our, our uh, you see on the screen is our website. Uh, we currently having our meetings by Zoom, but you are certainly welcome to go to the website to find out what the meetings are. Um, register um, with our Zoom manager and we would be happy for you to attend. Um, if you live in this area and you're interested in joining our organization, we would be welcome, you would be welcome to do that. Um, there's going to come a time when we're going to be back to normal again and we're going to be meeting in person, so we, we would welcome you. We're also doing some of our education classes on Zoom too, that's so that's right. another opportunity to learn. Thank goodness for that technology. We've been able to keep active.